Today, uh, we are going to continue a sermon series that started last week online called The Champions of the Old Testament. As I shared with you earlier in the service, um, 2024 is a year in which we're going to go back to the basics. We're going to talk a lot about narratives that many people know in the sure and certain hope that for those who have either been burnt by church in the past or have never really heard about the gospel story in its fullness, can come to church with some confidence that we're going to talk about a story that at least they might know. Last week we talked about Noah, and we're seeking to answer the question, what makes these individuals champions? Why do we still talk about them? Why are they regarded as some of the forefathers of our faith? And my hope is that each week we can talk about two insights that make these heroes special. And also gather confidence that you and I can embody these special traits and lead others to know God just as they did oh so long ago. Today, we are not talking about Noah. And if you haven't caught on to who we're talking about, I want to encourage you to grab a cup of coffee. <laughs> we're talking about Moses today. This is an individual whose story is filled with the wonders of the Lord. And much like all the stories we are covering this month, we just simply don't have time to go over the totality of his story. So we might as well jump forward to the good stuff, the happy ending of the story, where everything is good. Last week we talked about when Noah and his family got off the boat and what made Noah so special. Today we're gonna to talk about the moments after the miracle at the Red Sea where God parts what was a sea into a stretch of barren land, creating a pathway for his people to escape Egypt. I cannot wait to share with you the joy at the end of this story. But I also eagerly look forward to sharing with you a few attributes of why this man is so special and how you and I can take some of those traits into 2024. Before we read our scripture, I want to encourage you to please pray with me. Father, I come before you a servant to your call. May you speak through me in spite of me and let us do justice to your word this morning. Amen. <clears throat> Taking a look at our text, it is Exodus 15, verses 1 through 21. Uh, we're going to be talking about something called the Song of Moses today. It is an anthem about everything that has happened and how great our God is. So let's take a look. Reading from Exodus 15, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. 
Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood in a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes, seizes on the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established, the Lord will reign forever and ever. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand. And all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. All month long, we're talking about champions of the Old Testament. And the sermon title for each champion is supposed to sound like a champion walking into a boxing ring. You know, you have the grand introduction and you, you see the shadowy figure walk out into the ring and he's, he's, he's got his gloves on, he's got his head down. And you hear the introduction. The champion of Goshen probably isn't uh, the most catchiest of nicknames, but it's the one we're giving to Moses today. The reason is, is because he is indeed a forefather of our faith and should, regard, and should be regarded in high esteem among Christians today. However, one of the many problems of many biblical teachers today is that we very seldom in today's age go back to stories like this in an adult setting. We learn about these stories when we're young. Noah's Ark, Moses, Daniel in the lion's den, David and Goliath. And then we just never touch them again. I, I want to encourage you to put your feet into the sandals of those walking away from Egypt. A people who not too long ago had thought God had forgotten them. holding on to a faith 
that their fathers and forefathers said, God will show up and set us free. And then seemingly out of nowhere, Moses shows up. And you know the story. You know the story of him going to Pharaoh, pleading his case, warning Pharaoh over what might come. And over time, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And God showed his power and might. The plagues were brought upon Egypt. And upon the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh let Israel go. But here's the problem. The story doesn't end there. (laughs) See, Pharaoh had second thoughts. And the final act of this great exodus culminates, goodness gracious, at the Red Sea. Pharaoh wants his property back. People running for their lives. Men, women, and children. The elderly. Those who have waited lifetime for this moment are now met with a massive body of water and no way around. Then you know what happens next. One more time. He raises his staff and places it in the water, and the waters part. A miracle happening before the eyes of Israel. A way out. We're on the other side of all that now. We're walking away from what was, and now trying to digest it all. Trying to make sense of everything we've seen and heard. And then this passage comes along. It's not as catchy as a Waylon Jennings tune. It doesn't have the same ring as a Johnny Cash song. But man, it is one worth singing. This song comes about And it illustrates a couple points that I want to share with you that make the story of Moses and Moses in general so special. Because the song, the recap, talks about everything they have been through. And it does reflect the personhood of the hero we are highlighting today. Our first instance of this can be found in verse 13. I want to encourage you to read here. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You've guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Our first takeaway to what makes Moses so special is that he knows the love of God deeply. Do you remember Moses' story? He wasn't exactly this popular all the time. A man cast out from his own people, walking back in, hoping they'd take him back. Even his brother Aaron was skeptical about the motives of Moses returning to the fold. Of course, Moses comes back to Egypt and proclaims, I've been sent by the Lord to deliver you. And If you've ever waited on God for seemingly a lifetime, you might doubt too. And so the people that were supposed to wrap their arms around him, they scoffed and said, you're just one guy. What are you going to change? God has forgotten us. How many times are we motivated by knowing the love of God to keep going? 
I think that's a benchmark in Moses' story. Moses was rescued. Lost and alone, God appears to him in the side of a burning bush. And God assures him, no matter what excuse you have to throw my way, I'm going to be the one doing the heavy lifting because I love you and I remember my promises. I have a covenant with my people and through you, they will be delivered. And from that moment on, Moses knows with full assurance that God's love is real. I can't imagine what it would be like to stand in his shoes before Pharaoh, asking time and time again, please let them go. And Pharaoh's response continues to be more emphatic, no. That sounds an awful lot like many of the stories you've shared with me. Stories of, I've invited them to church. And pastor, I'm going to keep trying. But every time I do, they're always busy. Or they have an excuse. Or every time I try to talk to them about God, they're not interested. They don't want to hear it. But I know what keeps you going. I know why your heart bleeds for them. Because you know God loves them. You know God cherishes them. You know the deep and richness of the Lord's love. And that's what motivates us to share the truth and be persistent. To continue forward when the world says no. Christians march on because we know of God's love. And the fact that if he said it, then it's true. It is by his love God leads. His steadfast love. And that doesn't change. Moses knows that. The early church knows that. The church in 2024 knows that. And so no matter how many times we are said no, we will continue to answer the call to reflect the heart of Moses because we know the richness of God's love, not just for me, but for those who are saying no. So Moses knows the richness of God's love, and that motivates him into action. This song here reflects that. But there's one more thing I think that makes Moses so special. And it's a similar theme that we see from Noah's story. We talked about last week online, and if you haven't seen it, I hope you go to YouTube and check it out. It's great to learn that Noah was patient and Noah had the wherewithal to acknowledge God at the heights of joy. This second point will continue to be a theme through these champions of the Old Testament. And I want to show you how Moses here has the wherewithal, not just him, but God's people have the wherewithal in this moment to not take the glory for their own, but to give it up to the Lord. We talk about all this story, right? Very seldom mentioned is Moses' great speeches 
Moses' great leadership. Aaron's steadfastness. Miriam's attention to detail. All those things might be in between the words in our scriptures, but they're not here. This song is all about God all the time. And I love the ending of this song. I love the ending of this story. After you've, you've seen all the miracles of the Lord, how easy would it have been to look at your neighbor and go, I can't believe we just did that. When was the last time something miraculous happened to you and we just instantly slipped into, oh, this moment's about me. It's easy to do that. But look at the end here. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. This isn't an Israel thing. This isn't Moses' staff thing. This is a God thing. And time and time again in Moses' story, he's always acutely aware of the movement of the Lord. One of the signs in which Moses is prompted to show the one true God is he, he stands before the council of Pharaoh and God reveals to Moses, hold up your staff and then lay it down. And it will become a snake. Moses' declaration to start this is not, hey, look at my cool party trick. Look what I can do. I found this on Amazon. Behold the power of God. And we later learn that the snakes that were provided by the magicians of Egypt were eaten and devoured by the miracle of the Lord. When the waters of the Nile turn to blood, What is Moses' declaration? Behold, the power of God. It's all about God all the time. It's not about me. It's about who's working through me. And you know of people in your life, or maybe you are one of those folks, for your children, for your grandchildren. That always seems to be in tune with where God is working. We had a great conversation at men's breakfast yesterday over the struggle it is sometimes for us guys to pay attention to God moving all the time. But man, there are some people that just do it all the time. There are some people, it's just second nature to them. And it took Moses a little while, but man, is he hitting his stride. He's noticing God move at every corner. And that's what makes him such a powerful champion of the Old Testament. He is an individual that if you watch, he will let you know God is on the way. And it has nothing to do with him. Friends, who do you know in your life that knows the love of God deeply? And it motivates them into actions that we might find intimidating. And are they also incredibly aware of a God who's on the move? This is what makes Moses so special, so unique. And let me tell you, Christian, it's not a blueprint unfamiliar to the modern world today. 
I think of champions of the Scripture. One in particular who has gone to be with his Savior, Billy Graham. Billy Graham was a champion of the faith. Filled stadiums just simply by sharing the gospel. And never made it about himself. But continuously pointed to the Lord who made things happen. He knew God would show up in the arena. It wasn't him who folks came to see. It was the God speaking through him. But study upon uh, uh, or interview upon interview of those closest to Billy Graham would often say as a child he was shy. An individual sort of uncomfortable with being around people. Billy Graham. And yet, what propelled him into ministry? He knew the love of God. Not just for himself, but for the lost. And so life took him into positions in which he would have not found himself before. Just like Moses. God made himself known. Oh man, you really mean what you say. Well, buckle up. I got a ride ready for you. And the adventure begins. What adventure is God taking you on? What arenas of life is God encouraging you to go to that you might be a little uncomfortable with you're going to go because you know of the Lord's love. And how aware are you to the movement of the Lord in our midst? You focus on those two things, you're going to become a lot like Moses, a champion who we learn from little up and still have the great fortune to talk about today. The power of God moving through people just like you and me. What a special thing. This is God's word for God's people. Amen.